I needed to disconnect my AirPods from my computer. All right, we're, I think we're all good. Everyone looks good, Katie says. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jayatri Das, Chief Bioscientist here at the Franklin Institute. Thank you for joining me for our next installment of our COVID conversations, where we're talking about the science behind the ongoing pandemic and the information that you need to make decisions about your lives. We're in a phase right now where distribution of vaccines has started, but communities around the country are starting to prepare for a wider release of vaccines as we ramp up distribution and production. Um, hopefully this is an option that we'll all have a chance to take advantage of in the near future. But for all of that system um, development around vaccine, it still comes down to making a personal decision for each of us about whether to get it or not. So I'm really excited to be joined by a group of staff members from Penn Medicine today um, who will be talking through how they made their own decisions, the, the, the information that they're being asked about um, with their patient communities uh, you know, as part of the Penn Medicine team. So I'll go around and do some quick introductions because you all bring some really valuable perspectives. Um, so I'm gonna go in order that I see you on my screen here. So <laughs> I'll start with uh, Dr. Megan Lane Fall. And maybe you just wave your, wave your hand and <laughs> um, people will see your names. Um, Dr. Lane Fall is a physician scientist in anesthesiology and critical care at the Perlman School of Medicine. Next on my screen is Chef John Dixon. And Chef John is a chef at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So for those of you locally, if you've been to the hospital and gone down to grab some food, maybe you've met Chef John before. <laughs> Next on my screen is Nicole Brown, who is a nurse at Penn's Helen O. Dickens Center for Women. And last but not least is Kenya Pitt, who is a human resources manager for the clinical practices of the University of Pennsylvania and a member of the CPUP's anti-racism committee. So uh, before we get into hearing some of your thoughts, I wanna set the stage a little bit um, about what we're hearing uh, in terms of people's concerns about the vaccine as they think about this decision. So a recent survey from the Kaiser Family Foundation in January, 2021 um, showed that the most common side of uh, concerns that people have are number one, the safety of the vaccine, number two, the long-term side effects or the potential for long-term side effects, Three, the possibility of immediate serious side effects. And that four, that vaccines might not be as effective as they're said to be. And while these concerns are shared across the board by many Americans, they're also reported at higher levels among Black and Hispanic or Latinx people. And so I want to get at some of these uh, subtleties of the decision-making process as well. Because as we all think about risk, that decision gets complicated by the disproportionate impact of COVID-19, um, bo both because of systemic racism and disparities in access to the vaccine now, as well as the historical uh, inequities in science and medicine that we're coming um, into this situation with. So as we think about how we strive for justice in science and medicine to keep everyone healthy, uh, I want to start by asking each of you, because you represent a, a variety of different roles within pet medicine, but you've all been leaders in this conversation about the vaccine within the Penn community. So maybe can you tell us each of your stories about how you've stepped up in, in the different roles that you play? Uh, and uh, Nicole, maybe I'll start with you and, and people can jump in, but you know, as a okay. nurse, right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually having COVID um, has, is what some of the, is, is a factor which contributed for me to get the vaccine. Um, I did not like what I experienced having uh, COVID and somewhat of the long, long, long haul symptoms that I'm experiencing as well with it. I, I didn't like it. So I'm like, you know, what can I do if I can get the vaccine and show people that it's okay to get the vaccine and uh, hopefully, you know, I won't experience those symptoms again, then I'm all for it. <laughs> How about you, Kenya? Um, for me, um, 
and we did a similar activity like this at Penn Medicine where we offered a town hall um, to our workforce and we talked about our experiences with why. So I'll just echo what I shared there because it, it still rings true and it, it is what wholly informed my decision to get the vaccine. And my family, we experienced significant loss uh, during the last year um, as a result of COVID-19. We lost over 25 friends and family members between my husband and I um, who had contracted COVID and as a result of that had um, passed away due to various, uh, what's the word, complications as a result of contracting COVID. And so just the level of change and grief that we experienced and then just see, working in healthcare in a leadership position and being able to see uh, what was happening in various academic medical centers around the country, our own academic medical center and hospitals, um, what it was doing to families, what it was doing to staff and not wanting to contract COVID, that was really what complete, those things are what completely informed my decision um, to get the vaccine. And also having the privilege of being close to the science and being able to ask questions um, and get answers, right? Yeah. Very honest yeah. answers, very uh, logical answers was really what was, you know, what helped me make the decision. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry for your loss. And, and thank you for bringing up that, you know, that all those factors about weighing the, the risk, the, the, you know, the effects on each of us, mm -hmm. you know, from, yeah. from this very real disease and the idea of information. We're gonna, and I wanna come back to that because yeah. we are gonna talk a little bit about what kind of information is useful. But before we go there, um, I'll circle back to Chef John. Hello, everyone. Um, part of the reasons why I decided to um, get the vaccine is because I'm one of the, the leaders in my my area. Um, I've been working at the University of Penn over 30, 30 plus years. Um, I have a lot of respect from the, um, the management, the people, you know, I respect them as, as well, you know, um, the pavilion, which I, I love, I mean, because we do specialized meals for a lot of, um, you know, important people and not so important people. But, you know, I feel as though that um, I've seen a lot over this last year of um, a lot of loss. I mean, I lost my aunt, I only had one aunt. And um, and I, I see the, the fear that's in my department about um, about getting the needle and, you know, all the the negative around it. So I said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna be one of the first ones to get it. I'm gonna show, show the rest of them that it's safe, you know, and, you know, and it really doesn't um, affect me in any kind of way. So, and, and I became one of the poster childs, of course, um, for, um, for doing so. They asked me, could they take my picture? Can they post it around the hospital? Can, you know, can I talk to people? And I'm glad I did because I had a lot of, a lot of people come and get the shot ever since I had talked to them, you know? Um, and I told, I, my, my thing is fear will stop, stop you from moving forward. So that's why, that's my main plateau, you know, fear, you know? Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the main reasons why. Thank you. Yes. And Dr. Lane Fall. Sure. So, you know, you can call me Megan. That's fine. Um, but I'm a scientist. So, you know, I, I will amplify what Ms. Pitt said about the science, right? It, for me, I knew that a vaccine was on the horizon, even from the earliest discussions of COVID. And I remember back in February of 2020 thinking, is this thing coming? Is it going to hit? And then in March going, oh, it's here. And then we sort of got into it. But the discussions about the vaccine started very early on. And I remember hearing, you know, it takes years to make a vaccine. And I'm thinking, what are they talking about that they're going to have a vaccine this year? And then they did. And I said, oh, I don't know about this. Um, and so I delved into the science and so understood exactly what the vaccine was made of, which is mRNA, and we can talk about all of that, and how this actually isn't entirely new, that the technology to build the vaccine has been in the works for years. But I had to satisfy myself as a scientist that I understood exactly how it was supposed to work, exactly how it was going to be produced, what the mechanism of action would be, and convince myself that it could be done safely. And I was able to satisfy all those questions and curiosities. And so when, when the time came, I said, let's do it. <laughs> well, that, I think that's a great place to, to start our conversation because um, we do have some questions coming in already about the science of the vaccine. I know that you know, many of you have, have gotten information from, uh, from your colleagues, um, from your own research. So let's tackle this. Um, so one question is, does, do the vaccines alter DNA? 
Definitely not. No, that's not how they work. Um, and it's a good question because when you hear about RNA, it's close to DNA and you think, well, is this going to do something to me? Is it going to do something to my ability to have children? Um, and it's a fair question. The nucleic acids in RNA are similar to the ones in DNA. But basically what you're doing with mRNA is you're giving your body instructions for how to make an antibody, which can then fight the virus. So it's as if you're giving your body the recipe, but you're not, you're not changing your body in any fundamental way. The mRNA doesn't get integrated into your DNA in any way. There's, there's no way for that to happen. Um, so it is fair, but no, no, it does not change your DNA in any way. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's a great question. Um, and one thing that we're going to be hearing about in the next couple of weeks is that there's a third vaccine that's under consideration um, by the FDA right now um, that does work in a slightly different way um, from the two vaccines that were um, that were uh, approved for distribution earlier. Um, and while those two earlier vaccines use RNA, that then, like uh, Megan said, gives you the, you know, gives your body the instruction. The new vaccine from Johnson & Johnson um, is DNA-based. Um, it's packaged in a delivery virus that won't make you sick, um, but that DNA does enter your cells and then, again, provides your cells the instructions to, to make that um, piece of the virus to, to get your immune system to kick in. But again, none of it affects your own DNA. So I think that's a really important detail. Uh, Another question, and we got a bunch of questions coming in that I'm sure many of you have already heard. Um, and maybe I might sh uh, shoot this one to Nicole because you've had COVID and you know, yeah. you've, you've looked into this, um, is that if you've already had COVID, do you need to be vaccinated? I would say yes. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say yes, especially having it and um, enduring all those symptoms I didn't like. So. I wouldn't want it to be as severe if I were to get COVID again. So if the, if the vaccine is there to protect me, absolutely. And I think that that actually takes us into another question, um, which I think <laughs> is on all of our minds right now, is that we're hearing about new variants of the virus. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. you know, what, what's the buzz at Penn Medicine about what these, you know, these new variants, what risk these new variants pose? I think the buzz right now is that we're we're watchfully we're we're watchful waiting is what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. That we know that they're here in the U.S. I just heard about Hopkins getting new strains of it. It's in Boston. It's in Minnesota. Um, what we know so far is that the strains we think are just as sensitive to the vaccine, even though they're more virulent, meaning they're more transmissible. They're more contagious. Now that may change over time, and the whole the whole theme of COVID of the pandemic has been that we're learning as we go. And so everything that we tell you is what we know at the time, but all of us have to pay attention and watch how everything evolves over time. And I hope that we don't get to the point where the vaccines we have now aren't effective, but right now we think that they are. I think that's a really important point that you made is that everything we're talking about is, is science as we go. Um, and, you know, Chef John, can I ask you, as somebody who's you know, not a scientist yourself, how do, you, how do you keep track of all of the information that's coming out? Because I know that many, of, you know, many people who are listening right now you know, may feel overwhelmed by all of the science. So what, what's your, what's your go-to source? <laughs> well, you know, I, I pretty much, like I said, I, I used to be on the floors a lot talking to patients and, and unfortunately I can't no more you know, at this time. But, you know, I look at their um, their diets and, you know, things that I, I can do personally to make them feel better, make them, you know, recover more because, you know, medicine, you need food and food is medicine. So, you know, if I can, you know, help someone out, you know, overcome, you know, their anxiety or their angst for different reasons as they get better, you know, going through this, you know, because as right now the hospital's locked down, you can't visit, you know, any family members, I, I think that's, you know, it's sad, but, you know, it, it helps save everyone, you know, so, you know, I go through, I really, you know, like you said, I'm, I'm not looking at the science, I'm looking at the individual people and what I can do personally to help, you know, in any type of way. Yeah, it, re it really does take a village and, and the role that you play is so central 
um, mm-hmm. in, in the hospital community. What about you, Kenya? What are, what are your thoughts on trying to you know, stay on top of this information as it's changing? Well, like I mentioned earlier, working at an academic medical center, we have access to science and data and really great information. So I pay attention to how my organization communicates and they do a fantastic job of communicating out information to the workforce in a way that is easy to, to digest for the non-science, the non-scientist uh, members of our workforce. And then also I read, I watch the news, I pay very close attention to um, CDC and any release information that they share. I talk to uh, scientists, colleagues at the at the university. So I have a number of sources and resources that I use to gather information and to just stay on top of things. And I ask a lot of questions. I make a lot of mental notes. I email myself things to remember questions to ask because I'm one of those people that things come to really late at night or in the middle of the night and I want to know the answer. So um, so that my mom brain doesn't forget, I email <laughs> things to myself and I shoot those emails out to colleagues who can answer those questions for me. I think that's a great tip is that, you know, one of the things that we've seen is really how the, the scientific community has come together to activate the resources at hand. And there's so many scientists who are so willing to just talk and, you know, answer yep. people's questions. Um, so, you know, help you. Know, this is why we're here today. Um, you know, so keep sending us your questions. But you know, if something if something doesn't come to you right now, you know, certainly uh, shoot yourself an email to, to, to ask later. Look, I listen, that. I do whatever it takes to help me remember things right now. <laughs> I think you know, for for us here at the Franklin Institute, that's something that's so critical for us to keep in mind is that to be that accessible source of information because we mm-hmm. also know that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation yes. out there. Um, so trying to navigate and finding good sources of information can be a challenge when, mm-hmm. you know, we're all, you know, pulled in so many different directions. So I love your tip for just sort of keeping yourself on track and finding yes. the answers that you need. <laughs> <laughs> I picked that up in my senior year in college somehow. She's like, okay, email yourself, to remember to, to write this or add this to your paper. And it's, I won't say how many years it's been, but it's been a long time and it works. <laughs> <laughs> We have a couple of questions here um, about the vaccine itself. Um, One is that, are there new studies showing whether a vaccinated person can spread COVID if they get exposed? Do we know the answer to this yet? And Megan, maybe I'll throw this to you. Yeah, it's starting to come out. And I have to say, and I'm glad you brought up the differences in vaccines because I the vast majority of my experience is with the mRNA vaccines, so with the Pfizer and Moderna, which we've had around for a little bit longer. Um, there is some emerging evidence that they do actually decrease transmission. And I remember reading some of the some of the studies and some of the headlines and thinking, this is going to be really confusing to people because they're going to look at it and go, wait, we didn't know that already. <laughs> and really what we knew was that the vaccines decreased your symptoms. So it's really clear that they're tremendously effective at decreasing symptoms of COVID. And what we're hoping is that it also decreases the transmission, but we don't know that for sure. And that's why we still wear the masks and we still wash our hands and we still stay away from people. But it's looking like the vaccines, at least the mRNA ones, do have some effectiveness in decreasing transmission. So that's a good good sign. And I think there are some other questions here that are kind of in that nebulous realm as well. One is how long does a vaccine protect us? We don't know. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, we don't know. So we're we have to get two shots for the mRNA ones. The Johnson Johnson is only one shot. There, I've heard some buzz around about maybe there's a booster that's needed at some point, and we we just don't know. So that's another reason that you know, following what Ms. Pitt said, you have to you have to keep up, right? Like, yeah. I watch the news, reliable sources of news. I look to see what the CDC is saying, and right now. We don't know, um, but it's possible that we may need a booster at some point in the future. So, okay, here, here's here's a, a, a real a real world question um, for all of you. Have you all had the both have both shots of the of the vaccine? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, so a question that somebody has is, why do people have more of a reaction after the second shot than the first one? So, was that true for you? And then we can talk about the science. Um, it was definitely true for me. I actually just recently had my second shot and I did have more of a reaction with the second shot. Um, my first shot, it was a non-event. I barely even felt getting it. As a matter of fact, I recall, um, a discussion with the nurse who administered the vaccine to me saying, 
asking her, like, did you put the needle in yet? Um, and I work out a lot to, not that I've got like big guns or anything like that, but um, <laughs> I don't even remember the needle going into my arm. And I, I remember saying to her that um, the flu shot was a, hurt a little bit more than this one. Um, the second one I had, I did have a reaction. I had a slight fever. Um, I had a headache and I had the chills, but it was such a quick event that it was just really a, a, a lot to do about nothing, quite frankly. And um, when people have asked me about that, um, I've gotten a lot of very strong reactions about having re a reaction to the vaccine at all. And I, my answer to that is I'd rather contend with having um, a fever, some chills and a headache for 24 hours. And it really wasn't even, it was probably like a day and a half. I'd rather contend with that for a day and a half than to contend with COVID and any downstream medical implications that could come from that for a much longer period of time. Chef John, I saw you shaking your head. Um, yeah. Did you have a different experience? Well, I, the first time I took it, I, I felt like a stinging, burning sensation going down my arm for a little bit. And then I didn't feel it no more. I mean, of course, your, your muscles are a little sore because it's going right into your muscle. But um, I really didn't have no, you know, no negative. Um, I got um, six months perfect attendance. You know, I haven't been out a day, you know, that I was scheduled. So I, I really, you know. And just to show other people, you know, they asked me, I was like, yeah, I, I mean, I took both shots, you know, I got the card. I mean, you know, and I, I feel good, you know, and I feel confident that it's working in my body. And that's one of the main things. So, like I said, that's why I became one of the poster childs just to, you know, they got put up all, you know, different places in the hospital to show, you know, I got the shot, you know, and, you know, my experience from that. So. I suggest any everybody to please, please get the shot. I mean, what is the alternative? I think that's the really important question to, to, to get at. Um, and Nicole, I'm gonna bring this back to you because you had the experience both with COVID and the shot. Um, and what's what's the risk that that you think about it? You know, one of the things that as you know, as we talk about the risk of science is is being up front. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. You know, and not trying to hide um, the the potential downsides. Um, honestly, oh. so go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, honestly, uh, after having COVID, I did share with um, people were asking me, you know, um, how did you feel? You know, at my first and second shot, and after I received the vaccine the first time, it felt like the flu shot. Um, I felt the flu shot was worse, but I didn't have any, you know, besides the dull arm ache. That was it. Now the second in, um, vaccine. I had, um, it was like a, 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 like a fever, I mean, not a fever, uh, like a slight headache, um, but I would rather tolerate that than, than have, and it, it only lasted one or two days, but I would rather tolerate that than have the COVID symptoms, which I endured for a month, than, and, and rather get the vaccine. So I would rather have the vaccine. That reminds me of something that you said, Megan, when I listened in on your last conversation at the town hall, that you talked about this idea that the, that the decision to make isn't about vaccine or no vaccine, it's vaccine or COVID. Yeah. Can you, can you yes. talk a little bit more about, you know, what, like when, what the risks of the vaccine actually are sure. and how to factor that in? Yeah. So again, the, the vaccines that I have the most experience with are the mRNA vaccines. But if you look at the side effect profile, it tends to be what we've described. Not that many symptoms with the first vaccine, when your immune system is sort of revved up for that second one, <laughs> that's when it tends to hit people. I got super tired. I, mommy was out for a couple of days. I was just Netflixing and my arm was really sore and my kids are like, are you okay? And I'm like, I just need to chill out. Just for a weekend, it was fine. Um, we do see people have some allergic reactions, especially if you have a history of very strong allergic reactions. They're not common, but they can happen, which is why you tend to see the vaccines given in monitored settings. And we ask people to stay for a few minutes, usually at least 15. And if you have a history of severe allergic reaction, they ask you to stay a bit longer. They have epinephrine, they have nurses, like they're equipped to handle it. Um, there have been three reports of deaths after COVID vaccines. One of them was investigated and found not to be associated with, with the vaccine. That was a woman in Alabama. There was a physician in Florida who passed away after his platelet count fell abruptly. And then I've just heard of another woman, I think she was in Virginia, and they're still trying to figure out what's going on there. And those numbers are scary to people, understandably, 
But when you look at COVID, you know, we've had more than 400,000 people in this country die of COVID. Around the world, it's 2 million. Around the world, 100 million infected. And some percentage of those, we think probably 10-ish percent of them, experience what's called long COVID, which is where you have the symptoms for weeks, much like Ms. Brown talked about, right? You can have it for four weeks. Some people have had these symptoms for months. So when you're doing the weighing, when you're doing the risks and benefits, you want to think about it's not, do I get a vaccine or not? It's, do I want to get this other thing? Like, um, what are the chances that I'll get this other thing? And um, the chances that you'll get something like long COVID or that you'll get COVID and pass away are so much higher than if something were to happen with the vaccine. You're 200 times more likely, if not more, to die of COVID than you are to have this reaction to the vaccine. So if you're gonna play the numbers, the numbers go with the vaccine. And so that brings us to this, um, this point that that risk is then further exacerbated in some communities over others. Um, so if we're just looking at Philadelphia data, um, we know that you know, in the whole population of Philadelphia, 44% of our population identify as black, 15% identify as Hispanic or Latinx. But when we look at the hospitalization rate, um, we see that among white and Asian residents, the hospitalization rate is 51.5 per 10,000 residents. That's uh, one and a half times that rate for Hispanic and Latinx populations and double that rate in black populations. And yet the flip side is that if we look at who's gotten the vaccine, and this, this is uh, data through last week, 15% um, of black Philadelphia residents uh, oh sorry, 15% of the vaccinations have gone to black residents, and only 3% have gone to, to Latinx people. So those are just numbers, um, but what are all, all you seeing in, um, in the communities where you live and work? Can you help us put a human face on the impact? And you know, uh, you've all spoken very eloquently on the, the personal impact that you've seen on your own families. What does that mean when we're looking at how to tackle this as a city? Well, um, I think there's a couple things here that need to be examined and considered when you look at the disproportionate rate of members of the Black and Brown community at Penn Medicine and in the city at large um, as it relates to the uptake of receiving the vaccine. And the, I think a critical factor to consider is access to information, um, education, and healthcare disparity, specifically as it relates to how black and brown people have historically been treated um, as healthcare consumers and patients um, in hospital settings or medical settings, right? You, you think about, and, and I'm sure what I, when I say this, this will resonate with a lot of people, you'll understand why. You think about historically um, in the black community, or if you think about uh, in the brown community as well, things like the uh, Tuskegee experiment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned this in a Penn Medicine uh, town hall because I think it's relevant. I think it is one thing that very strongly informs how we as people um, see and, and, and kind of measure out trusts for healthcare professionals. You think about Henrietta Lacks and what's you know happened with her specimen, how it was collected and without her consent. And you just think about um, the way black and brown people are treated or interact with healthcare professionals when they feel like they're not taken seriously. And that does go away to undermine trust in science and undermine trust in the healthcare profession. And when you think about a, in this lifetime, no one on this phone call or in our communities have ever been, a, 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 have ever lived through a major pandemic. The last major pandemic was over a hundred years ago. So this is the first time for all of us, right? And, Maybe very few of us in the generate, depending on the generation, have lived through the creation of a vaccine, right? There's some newer vaccines. Um, so this is new to all of us. This is new science to all of us, no matter how close to the data and science we are. Um, and, but in particular, when you look at the Philadelphia community, the average resident in, in Philadelphia doesn't work at an academic medical center and have access to that data. And so I think there's a, a What's contributed to that uh, that lack of uptake for the vaccine are all those things, the lack of education, the lack of access to information, and just the fear of going uh, going through what some of our ancestors and predecessors have gone through when it comes to you know our relationship with healthcare. 
But the difference is we have access to information. I just want to interrupt you. I want to pause you for your real quick because I'm not sure that everybody might not be familiar with some of the examples that you mentioned. Um, And so you you mentioned both the Tuskegee experiment and um, Henrietta Lacks, both of which I think are really important stories for all of us to be aware of. Can you briefly summarize um, what each of those um, periods of, of, you know, really mistreatment in medicine involved? Sure. I mean, and I'm going to give it to you in my lame that's terms, great. My nine prime <laughs> terms. So you think about the uh, Tuskegee experiment with those all those men who were um, <clears throat> participating willingly or not, or f- being fully aware of not in that experiment and receiving a vaccine for syphilis, and what the downstream impact of that was to them, like the really bad and uh, significant physical effect after effects of receiving that vaccine, def- uh, deformation, burning all kinds of really traumatic medical experiences that they received without really being fully informed of what they should expect. And some of the scientists knew the outcomes of, you know, uh, participating in a trial like that, but they weren't very forthcoming with those men. And even today, the downstream impact of that with their families and, and different things that they've gone through. And these are people who participated in the study with the hope of, you know, being part of a positive outcome for a disease that was really rampant at that rampant at that time. And it was not a positive experience for them at all. Many of them lived their lives until the end with really painful deformities that they had to live through and didn't really get great health care or access to care to take care of those deformities that they um, that they had received. Then you think about Henrietta Lacks, a woman who was treated for um, women's health and gynecological is- oncology issues and as a result of not really knowing or understanding what was going on, obviously, you know, the scientists and physicians who had treated her took a biopsy. They took samples of her cells so they could study what was happening with her. And without her permission or consent, did a number of studies on those cells and and, and that were taken from that biopsy and created all types of other um what's the word I'm looking for? Uh her cell lines. Mommy brain. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um from from her biopsy without ever telling her, right? And so she contributed to remarkable strides in healthcare when it comes to finding uh, healing and, and different uh, resolutions for various medical issues, but never gave, never got her consent. Um, and so when you think about that, that's devastating for her family, for her generations that, come, that came after her. And to know that she, from her own personal physical body, didn't even have, didn't have, they didn't consider enough of her to give her agency over her own body. That's hard, that's traumatic. and. You know, and just the regular everyday experiences that you may have as a, a, a woman, um, a, a person of color going to a physician sometimes who do, you feel like they don't listen to your concerns, you feel dismissed, you feel disenfranchised, and you don't necessarily speak the language enough to be an av- a strong enough advocate for yourself to be able to listen. And if you're in your regular everyday experiences, you don't feel like your thoughts or your or what you're experiencing is considered that's going to go a ways to undermining the trust in that process. In particular, you don't want to feel like, I mean, this is the point that I was trying to get to earlier. You don't want to feel like you're being a guinea pig to test out a vaccine that's never been tested or no one's ever experienced. And I think all those things paired with some of the misinformation and disinformation, you have a recipe for a lack of interest in in taking the vaccine. And I'm sorry if that was a really long- No, I think you brought up- I think you brought up a lot of really great points and I'd like to get some of the other thoughts on this is that, you know, what, what are some, where do you feel cautious or where do you feel confident about the way that these vaccines have been developed? Um, And Nicole, maybe I'll throw that question to you first. At first, at first when um, the vaccine was being introduced, I was a little hesitant and I'm like, okay, but the more um, speaking with my colleagues and uh, watching, I watch, um, I stay on uh, the CDC website. So I felt that made me feel more confident to want to get it. So it's nice. So when I'm able to speak with my patients and they're asking me, you know, things they won't ask the physician and they're like, well, how did you feel? And blah, blah, blah. You know, I like that because then they, they trust me. And, and some of them have even seen me um, post my picture after I received the vaccine on social media and they're, and then encourage them to want to get it. And they're like, you did it. I want to do it. So that's a, that was, that was a nice I think that means a lot to have people kind of forge the, forge the path. Um, yes. it, it makes others feel safe. Um, what about you, Chef John? Well, one of the things is, you know, from coming up in my era, um, like my father, you know, I, I used to follow what he used to do, you know, as far as um, his actions, as far as um, don't see a doctor, you know, um, 
it's a lot of different things that um, he tried to embed in us about um, uh, science is bad, doctors are bad, don't go to a dentist, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and then come to find out he had passed when he was in his 50s. Well, um, I'm, I'm 58 years old now. You know, I was at one point 300 plus pounds. You know, I turned around my life by life changes, getting that negative out of my mind of um, following something that's, that I know that's pretty foolish, you know. Um, I knew it, you know, as I got older, you know. Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of things have to do for, from his father and it's like a history lesson all over and over again. So what I, what I taught my daughters, um, I taught them about um, the very importance of having good credit, um, you know, education, you know, being pushed more than the average um, person beside you, you know, and, and to do better. So, you know, this is, you know, when, when I seen uh, the, I came over just to visit to see, you know, how things was, was going on in here, you know, see who was getting the, the shot and everything. And I see a lot of doctors and nurses, they're like right there in line. And, you know, and I'm thinking like, you know, maybe I should be one of the ones to get this shot and, you know, prove to, you know, the people that I work with that, that it's, it's healthy, it's safe, you know, and um, we can, you know, stop with the stigmatism and, and go forward because where do we go from here? You know, I, I would like to have um, my mom, you know, be around a crowd again, you know, Thanksgiving was the, the um, you know, like, it wasn't nobody there, you know, yeah. and, and my mom's 80 plus years old. So, you know, you know, I'm very protective of her. So, you know, I, I think that this vaccine will help us get to where we need to be, you know, and it's going to take some time. Chef John, you spoke to a comment that somebody shared that I think is, 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 you know, common among many people is that sometimes the information isn't enough. It feels scary. Uh, and so how do we support each other um, mm -hmm. in, you know, a couple of you have mentioned that idea that, that, fear was stopping us and that that's a real consideration yeah I, I think giving voice to it is important and that's part of what we're doing here um and chef i'm sorry if i cut you off so i'll let you i'll let you go but i think just giving people space is a really important thing i agree with that i agree and chef you made a good point about the generational passing down misinformation i think that's a huge factor right you can generation to generation perpetuate these misinformation and myths, if you will. Um, and I don't mean to say that in a dismissive way, but access to information and awareness is critical because it informs well-meaning and well-thought-out decisions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I truly I'm believe also, that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll uh, to piggyback off of you, Kay. I also, um, um, a lot of my friends who uh, seen their doctors receive the, um, the vaccine it really encouraged them to want to get the vaccine as well. So actually visually seeing their um, provider receive the vaccine and uh, other healthcare workers encouraged them a lot. Me too. That was critical for me too. So the idea that, that, that people in healthcare are putting mm -hmm. themselves up first, it doesn't feel so much like the medical community is, is, is testing the rest of us as guinea pigs. But right. And then people can first. see that, you know, oh, they're just like me and they received the yeah. vaccine, so I can do it too. <laughs> that was very powerful, very powerful yeah. for me. So I think, I think there are a few things. One is the um, giving voice to these fears, talking about the history. I do want to offer a clarification about Tuskegee and that the, the experiment was the it was the Naturals, Natural History of Syphilis in the Negro Male is, yes. was the name of this study. They didn't yes. actually give anyone syphilis and they didn't give anyone any vaccines. Right. They just waited, but that was bad enough because they had a cure and they so didn't- they, with, they actually withheld the- They withheld Thank you. Thank treatment. you for clarifying that. They oh, withheld no, my the pleasure. Treatment. They withheld the treatment, right. which was completely immoral. It was completely wrong. They let these men die with complications from syphilis have unbearable pain. They let them pass it on to their partners who then passed it on to their children. So I am not trying to minimize because it was horrible. Right. But sharing these stories is important. I think talking about how this is different, how this vaccine has been created in the open, there's this level of transparency we've never seen before. There have been black and brown scientists involved in the creation of the vaccine. 
So if you look at the Moderna vaccine, Kazmikia Corbett was one of the scientists who's an immunologist who helped develop it. I'm like, oh, there's a black woman who made the vaccine. Okay, maybe I'll take that one. Um, but having these conversations, I think, goes a really long way toward, toward helping people feel more comfortable. I think that's a really important point that you made about the process as well. And certainly as uh, these companies are testing, you know, test tens of thousands of volunteers, um, there's, a, there's an effort to make sure that there are black and brown volunteers that are included. Because in the past, um, there have been you know, studies done that didn't include um, diverse populations. And as a result, we don't know whether it works for all people. Um, so, so, and having all of that information publicly available, like you said, that transparency matters. A couple of folks have asked some specific questions around individual health conditions, and I do want to urge you to talk to your uh, healthcare provider about any, um, any specific questions you have. Um, but just in terms of a, a general question about uh, immunology, um, if you have previous, you know, allergies and heart problems, does that put you in a different risk category for the vaccine? So I would echo what you said, which is that you should talk to your provider. I think that's really the most important thing there. Yeah. What I would say is if you have allergies or pre-existing conditions, I think that puts you in the category of I need to talk to my doc before I go. Great. You know, <laughs> there are lots of folks who, you know, if you're, if you're 70 years old or you're 75 years old and you're healthy, just go get your vaccine. But if you have a pre-existing condition, it's worth picking up the phone, sending an email, sending a text and saying, hey, let me talk through this. And they're ready for you, right? They've been getting these questions, they understand. So I would do that first. So I wanna, as in our last few minutes here, um, I wanna look forward. Um, so the question that is of course in anybody, in everybody's mind is, what are your best guesses about when life might get back to some <laughs> semblance of normal? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> uh, what, what, what's your best guess from you know what you're hearing about when life might get back to some type of normal? Well, I, me personally, I think it's going to be at least another year. I, I, I'm not even going to, um, you know, because yeah. like once once we start getting over this hurdle with, um, you know, the black and brown community um, being vaccinated and, you know, things, you know, become so-called normal, you know, it's going to take a while, you know, but I, I, I'm looking towards the future, you know, because I'm, I'm seeing like we starting to get things opening back up. So it's, it's a slow process, you know, and I would love to see um, family members come visit their their um, their loved ones in the hospital and, you know, the, the patients in there leaving and, you know, healthy. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I would say another year. I agree. I would say another year. Uh, I don't so, want it to be oh, another year. Yeah, I, I know. Want no, no, want nobody it wants it to be. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm trying to, to my face, and I'm like, no. no. Yeah, there's this part of my brain that's like where it probably is going to be, and then the part of my brain that's like, no. Yeah. Um, the, the other piece of this is we were worried about what would happen with influenza. My kids and I called it influrona. Like, what's going to happen when everything hits? And we saw very few cases of flu vanishingly few cases of flu, which is good, but I worry about what happens if and when flu comes back. And then will we know if it's Corona versus influenza, are we gonna shut down? Like, I think I think Chef Dixon's probably right that yeah. we're looking at about another year, I would suspect of things being weird. Uh, I, I agree with that. The I chef agree. is always right, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're the hub of a hospital, right? You're probably getting all of the information. <laughs> Uh, so I, I was reading that Penn right now is focusing on getting vaccines out to certain patient groups um, at, at higher risk. Um, do you have any insight into the, you know, the broader efforts at vaccination in Philly? When do you think we'll start getting to that phase 1B? Uh, me, me personally, I hope soon because my mom says she can't wait to get it. <laughs> you know, so I, I hope it would, would be really soon. <laughs> What I know I would say is, 
everything that's so. in the news. I hope that we get there. I think that we are suffering from some of the coordination difficulties yeah. that many other cities are suffering from. Mm-hmm. In addition to, we had a contract with a company that didn't pan out. And so, you know, we see lots of grassroots efforts, which are great. So there's the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium that Dr. Stanford is running. Penn is standing up something in West Philly. There's lots of efforts to get people vaccinated, but I think um, it's gonna be a little time before we see that whole coordinated response. So my last question is, how do we stay positive in the meantime? What keeps all of you going? Um, you know, there's a question, like, how do we hold up mentally? I mean, that's, that's a really important question. Keep off the negativity. Don't read too much into the negativity. Yep. Chef John said something. He said he's looking forward to being able to gather with his family and friends again and get back to what you know brought them joy in that. And I think that's one thing um, to, to just kind of, to Nicole's point, stay focused on the positive, be hopeful, and see the silver lining and the blessing in everything, big or small. I think, I think, yeah, go ahead. I think yeah. we have to give ourselves a little bit of grace that we're all going through very difficult times right now and that We don't all know how to get it right. And even for folks, when we think about the vaccine, I've talked to colleagues who say, I understand everything you're saying and I still don't want to get it. And I go, okay. Like I get that we're all scared. I get that we're all just trying to do the best we can. So that's how I try to stay positive is by giving myself some grace and giving other people grace. I think that's that's great advice. (laughs) And in the meantime, we can all just keep protecting each other by wearing masks and keeping our distance and, you know, no matter what variant comes along, we know that, that some of those work in just and, ways and, to take care of each other. And one quick thing, one, th- one quick thing I like about after I got the vaccine, the CDC contacted me every day and asked me, how do I feel? Um, do I have any symptoms? You know, so it's not like they gave it to you. You know, when they gave it to me the first time, it was, it was like that. The second time, they still contacted me even at weeks later just to see, you know, how I'm doing, you know, and I, and I appreciate that, you know, that, you know, that you can actually, you know, talk to, I mean, you know, well, text, you know, how, how are you feeling? So, you know, it's not like they didn't give you the shot and just left you out in the wind, you know, they, they want to know, you know, how you feel. So I, I really, you know, I really appreciate that, you know, That's I mean, great. me personally. So as we wrap up here, um, we have a very practical question of where can you get the vaccine? Um, there are different links to go to, whether in your, you're in Philadelphia, whether you're in Pennsylvania, whether you're in New Jersey. So we'll post some of those links um, in the chat so everybody can follow up depending on where they are. Um, but thank you all so much. We're incredibly honored to have your voices. Thank you as for part inviting of this me. Thank you. Thank you. thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You're just hearing first person um, experiences, you know, with the decision that you made with the vaccine itself, um, and you know, as as leaders in the healthcare community, um, we're just so honored to have you um, here to talk to us today. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much.